WWT presents Meet the Chief. Hi, everybody. My name is Tracy Byrne, and welcome to another episode of Meet the Chief. We are super excited to have Sanjay Merchandani with us, the CEO of Commvault. So you guys have been an amazingly trusted leader in this space for 13 years, consecutive leaders in the Magic Quadrant. I'd be really amazing to hear from you about how this industry has evolved over the years. Super. Tracy, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, before I was CEO, I was CIO and have the notoriety of being the CIO on on the on watch when RSA got hacked. Okay, one of the most famous nation state attacks in, of its kind and the, one of the earliest of its kind. And what we learned then and what, what continues to be paramount today is what they want is the data. They always want the data. They don't want your trucks. They don't want your factories. They, they want your data, okay? And data protection has evolved. It used to be really around um, somebody making a mistake, insider threats, natural disasters, you know, but today it's cyber. And the, and, and the vector that we're all worrying about aside, but the, but the fundamentals of protecting data, protecting every workload that runs your business, not, not just being selective about it, and having a uniform platform that does it for you, because that is the, that is the secret sauce. Having one platform that gives you visibility across everything uh, is paramount. Now that data protection in and of itself is at the heart of what has become cyber resilience. And I'm sure we'll, we'll 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 touch on that in a bit. But cyber resilience is the is the modern outcome, the heart of which is data protection. Yeah, absolutely. So at WWT, we help and coach our customers through their cyber res, uh, resilience programs very very frequently, and we're seeing just a huge uptick um, in the prominence and, and the interest and in really making sure we're driving that maturity. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing from your vantage point about the conditions in the market um, and in cyber that are driving this? Absolutely. Now, cyber, you know, means a lot of things to people like, okay, cyber resilience, what does that mean? So a lot of money has been spent over the past, let's say 10 years on defenses, identification, defending, um, being able to root out, you know, the bad actors. Yes. And we can keep and we will keep needing to keep, you know, be fresh on that front. We call that the left. But as you move down the kill chain, as you move towards beyond identifying and, and removing them out of your network when they when they when they come in, um, really being able to recover your data and now rebuild your business. So in our mind, it, the continuum has shifted right. In fact, our, our global events for customers are called shift. We've done this now for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. and Shifting is really not only thinking about the left side, which is defending primarily, but also being able to recover. Yeah. So much so that as a company that that was, is almost synonymous with the word backup, we've, we've, we've started saying to customers, the question you ask yourself today is not, do I have a good backup? It's, am I ready to recover? And that ability to recover is what resilience is about. And that is the shift. That is the mental state. That is the preparedness that you know, our customers have to have to have to go through uh, because it takes, you know, I always say this, they have to, the bad guys have to be correct once. They have to get through once. We have to be right 100% of the time. So we've got to get that perfectly balanced. Yeah, it, it's it's very true. And one of the, the interesting elements of this, when we really talk about cyber resilience as a whole, it's is we, we all know that it's, it's more of a timing scenario. When is it going to happen to your organization? But I really love that you guys are looking at it so broadly because it's not just about technology, it's about process, it's about readiness. And I think as we see more of a focus in this space, um, really all of those best practices are gonna become elevated so they can recover when, when something does happen. Um, to kind of dig into that just a little bit more, you know, when we talk about our enterprise customers, they have such complex cloud applications. Many of them are, are you know, natively built. Um, that becomes a major challenge when they're trying to recover quickly and bring themselves back up. So can you talk about what you've invested in as an organization to really address this, this gap, right, that our customers are facing in their own defenses? It's a great question. So, you know, recent, recent study we did, about a thousand leaders in, in technology, we asked them what their take was on breaches and 83% of them had a significant breach in the past year. Okay, now what is scary is the ones that don't think they've had a breach or are not going to get breached. 
Okay, now when you get breached, it's chaos. And you spend a lot of time trying to figure out who done it. What did they take? What did they get? How long was it? Yeah, so you've got all the forensic work going on. But really what, what matters is but if you're a CIO, your phone's ringing from the C-suite saying, when are we coming back to life? The world knows we're down. Okay, now when you double click that, Tracy, let's say you did a perfect implementation with us and we get your data back. Let's say it's a 24, if you, if you were in the show 24, of the 24 continuous hours, it takes you eight to 10 hours to get your data back, assuming that you've done it all right. The rest of the time is what it takes you to get your app stack back. So you get the data, it's validated, it's clean, it's ready to go. And then you have to test it. You have to bring the entire application stack back up to make sure the data works. Now you don't run one, one app stack in a, in a business. You've got hundreds, if not thousands. Some are traditional, some are bare metal, some are virtualized now, and some are in the cloud. Now, what we did was recently bought a very exciting company, young company, with some exciting technology that is truly multi-cloud. It's called Apranix. The company's called Apranix. And what Apranix does is, a, is allows you to go that last mile. So in that 24-hour circle, it brings back the application in its entirety alongside the data. So it's a completely cloud-native capability. It works on all three major clouds. And what it does is it does, based on your policy, it will it will snap the data and make, make copies to give you the right level of, of, of data protection. It also takes application uh, config, what makes up a cloud native app, which, are, which is a very loosely coupled engineering capability. You, you can use, people use different elements of what they want on different clouds. We take all those resources and we know what makes up an app. And then we know the sequencing and the restoration process of that app. And so what could take you otherwise, weeks, months to come back, we can do in, in minutes, hours. Okay, and it's completely automated and uh, available. There's no, it's completely cloud native. So we're, we're taking that last mile very seriously to say, you know, how does a business have continuous capability? So I'm not just thinking protection, I'm thinking the ability to bring a business back to life, including the applications that run it and uh, at scale. So that was an exciting element of it, but just one piece of what we do. Yeah, no, it, it really is so exciting because I, I mean, when we talk about this landscape, right? Like when you talk about, you know, businesses going down and the critical minutes that tick by, I mean, we've seen so many events like this that impact absolutely everyone and everything. Um, so it, it's really important that we be thinking ahead on how do we respond in these types of scenarios. Um, so we, we really kind of dug into technology there, which is obviously extremely critical. But can you talk to us about how you guys assist in the process itself? Yes. And, and if there's one thing I learned from, from being at the helm when you get breached is you're never ready enough. And the more ready you can be, the more prepared you can be, the more realistic your chances of recovery. Okay. And in a way that's predictable. Most importantly, it's predictable. So we, you know, we've got 1100 patents for a company of our size. You know, we're very focused on what we do. We've got 1100 patents and, and some of the some of the innovation that we brought to market in the last, let's say last year is, I'll, I'll call out one, um, clean room recovery. So we take the, the traditional concept of a clean room, which was this, this sealed spot that had equipment that mirrored everything else you had, just super expensive, barely anyone could afford it. You really didn't want to touch it because you didn't want to mess with the config. And you hope that if something bad happened, you could go in there and bring your business back to life. Great concept. Mm -hmm. not the most practical and not the most scalable because you can't have premiums for every single workload that you that you have out there. So what we did was took took that concept and brought it into the into a cloud native way. And so we give you the ability of spinning up on demand in good times, in good times, like today, your IT team could go in and spin up as many clean rooms as they wanted. It's zero trust architecture. It's pristine. You know, there's nobody in the network because we just brought it up and you, we give you Active Directory backup, which is very important. The first thing that goes is the Active Directory. You cannot trust your Active Directory if you've been breached. We bring back Active Directory. We bring back your crown jewels, your data from an air-gapped copy that we have of yours. And then we bring the automation to bring that entire stack back to life. And you can do that on demand as often as you want for every single workload, cheap and cheerful, in good times, okay? Why? so that you can use it to build your playbooks. And so God forbid, the first time you get breached is not the first time you're trying to do this. And 
customers are really embracing this, and I'm sure our teams are, are working together to get this in the hands of customers because this is this is truly innovative. Okay, we took we took a tried and tested concept that had its limitations and completely modernized it. It's so critical, and I, I think that really shows how you guys sit on the same side of the table as your customers because it's it's just like anything else. You have to exercise those muscles to be able to respond properly. And when you don't have the time or you're under so much stress that you can't think about it as clearly as you normally would. So I just think, yeah, this, this, this element of, of practicing and really putting in the hours, it's, it's almost a sports methodology, but I think that's kind of the world that we live in. And, and that's why my partners like WWT come in, right? You could be working with customers in good times to really test those out, help them build the playbooks, help, help them do, you know, these, these desktop exercises that companies do to make themselves feel better. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't feel better. If that's the only defense I had, I'm not going to feel better. It's, a, it's an academic exercise that's limited to nothing. And what you want is the breadth. You want every workload tested. You want the playbooks to be refreshed. You want people to be trained and knowing how to do this, the, the, the ecosystem inside of a customer, including us. And that's the value we bring. This is the most, I believe, in, in our 27 years, the most partner friendly platform we have ever released. Yeah, ab absolutely. And we certainly do feel that in the partnership. And that really just translates into how smoothly and effectively we deliver to customers. So uh, it's, it's been a very worthy cause and, and one that's been great to work on together. Um, can we talk a little bit about, you know, this, you know, this shift in the market towards how do we support the use of AI, generative AI in our customers' environments and how that impacts this particular element of, of cybersecurity. I mean, you and I both know you can't go to the supermarket without seeing AI somewhere, you know, <laughs> in the aisle. But, but if you really distill it down, AI is extremely powerful in, in our business. Customers trust us with data tracing. At the end of the day, we're the last stop for them to get their businesses back to life, okay? So if everything goes wrong, they know that they've got comfort protecting their data. Now, we take that responsibility very seriously. We've had customers with us for decades, okay? And, and as much as AI has incredible promise and we are using it in every, in every conceivable way we, we think we can, we're taking a very responsible approach to it. So data protection first, everything else second. So the number one requested thing for me as a CEO when I talk to customers is, give me foolproof recovery, Sanj. Tell me where to start because when when everything's when the dam bursts and you're in the throes of a breach, you don't know the forensics. You you run a security business. You don't know at that point what has happened. You don't know who it is. You don't know if you to believe it. You don't trust anything, anyone, or any environment inside the network. Mm -hmm. It is absolute chaos. And so while chaos reigns, we're still trying to help customers come back to life. So where do they start? Which day? Which time? So that you don't bring it back. You don't bring back malware. So you've got, you, you know, you, you're scanning to know that you're bringing back clean data. So we're using AI primarily, primarily to assist customers in recovery, mm -hmm. giving them bulletproof start points, recovery points, okay? To say, hmm, based on all the forensics, machine learning, everything that we've been doing on your environment, we think November 14th is the right point to start. Now we'll iterate from there. And you can use the clean room technology to to spin up an environment, test your environment, make sure it's not dirty, and then rinse repeat until, until you get it right. And for us, AI is incredibly powerful in helping customers recover, number one. Number two, the more complex a customer's environment, the more I can use AI to help them operationalize it better. So just good core you know, ops, infra ops, backup ops, and sec ops, okay? Helping them get that right. Um, and, and then going down the, the, the logical chain of things of, you know, having, having a co-pilot and, and all of those things. But really, our deep focus is recovery capabilities and operational excellence inside of the product. Yeah, it's, it, it is such a powerful tool. And it's, it, it always comes back to this kind of uh, analogy that we make where it's man versus machine. So we really do have to step up and leverage the same, you know, um, defensive mechanisms that are that are using on the offensive. So yeah. um, it's just, yeah, it's something where every organization is adopting it and there's so many different use cases to, to get value out of out of generative AI. So but it's, you know, it's going to go through, sorry to interrupt, but I think it's going it's going through the same the same life cycle of validation that 
a SaaS app did 10 years ago, eight years ago. You know, you didn't just throw in a SaaS app into your, into your environment. You wanted to make sure you, you knew what the standards were, what, you know, what they had behind it, what, and so on and so forth. And I think for every customer that asks me excitedly, what do we have by way of AI and our technology? Another one will ask me if you have a kill switch, because mm -hmm. they're not ready. You know, they don't have their policies in place. We're building it very responsibly. So everything we're putting in by way of machine learning and AI, and a lot of what we do is really machine learning, a deep amount of machine learning mm -hmm. in the environment for the customer. It doesn't leave the customer. And, and that allows you to be um, both operationally and, and, and from a recovery point of view that much better. So we're just getting started, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny, too. I mean, we talk about machine learning, and that's, you know, a concept that's been around for, you know, over a decade. And so as we as we know, that, you know, that the process of validation and, and being able to leverage that technology, I think we're starting off from a really solid foundation, just given how much machine learning was already developed in so many of the tool sets. Agreed. Wonderful. Well, I would love to learn a little bit about you. We've talked a ton about technology, but you've had just a really incredible career yourself. Can you talk to me a little bit about how you got started in the industry and some of the organizations that you um, that you led and built? It would be uh, really some great some great learnings for our listeners. Um, well, thank you. Um, well, I, I, I'm I'm a, you know I'm a technologist by training, but that was that was. Uh, I go back, I go back a long way. Uh, I realized very quickly, thankfully, thankfully, that I was better at helping customers with technology than actually building technology. And so I would have been the worst developer on the planet. So thank God I, 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 I took my, my technical mind, but really applied it uh, more towards helping customers with solutions. Um, and from a career point of view, I've always, I've always tried to take options that were less defined. It's just, just my per so that I could have my fingerprints on if, on it. If it worked, great. If it didn't, okay. But at least I wasn't just part of something doing a small piece of it, but actually having a say in it. And that's risky. Sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't work. Okay. And I've had both of those go happen to me. And then decided I wanted to be uh, a CEO. I kind of decided I wanted to be a CEO when I was CIO. And I think the best training for a CEO is being a CIO. Mm -hmm because you see every element of the business, every single element of the business. And then I, I, I became, uh, I got the opportunity to be CEO of Puppet, which was an open source company, which was very well known, much bigger than its actual, you know, uh, revenues. It was very well known. One of the leaders in the open source config management, predecessor, if you would, to, um, you know, some of the, some of the automation we have today. Mm -hmm. uh, did that and then Convol called. And, and I just, I loved it because the technology, I knew Commvault when I was at EMC, we competed. Yeah. And when I came in and I met with the, with the leadership team and the board, I was, um, I was enamored. I was just absolutely in love with the tech. Um, our, it was a nice little business that needed a little shaping at the time. Mm -hmm. um, great people, great culture. And, um, you know, and I, I, I'm so glad I did it. So oh, I don't know, you know, gave you perspective, but you know, that's, that's sort of how I think about my, my 37 years. Oh, that's amazing. I, I, there's so many pieces of that, that I, I kind of want to pull out a little bit. Um, your career has been incredible. And I think I, like you can feel the energy that you have for building really good, solid organizations and kind of bringing people up and also kind of keeping like one of the biggest takeaways I just heard from you is rather than passing any pressure or stress through in a way that's just very raw it's really being cognizant of everyone around you and, and helping them achieve their greatest goals you know while being an extremely healthy great culture so i think that's just huge i don't know my management team will agree with you but that's what i that's what i try and do you know i it, it's that's, it's super cool to hear and it's uh just more alignment in the, in the cultures of our organizations um, you know, neither of our companies are new, but they, they act as innovators. They act in some ways like, like very large successful startups because we're, they're always infusing new ideas into the business. And what's a better way to do it to drive a better outcome for our customers? Because every single day we're essentially in a new security terrain. Exactly true. And, and when you've been around for a little while, you know, it's, it's about, it's not about dismissing the fact that you've been around. It's about acknowledging what that has taught you. Okay, and, and so when we bring in new talent into the company and we infuse it with, we, 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 we 
almost systematically put them with people who've been around a little while in the company, there's this cross pollination of, of ideas. Here's why mm -hmm. we did it. not be the right thing today, but here's why we did it. And here's what it did for us. What's a better way of thinking about it, especially when you, especially when you buy companies, when you acquire companies, you, you can't squash that. You right. have to, you have to fuel that. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Absolutely. Cause there's a reason why they got to the place where they are, where you wanted to bring them into the fold. So it's kind of highlighting all those areas and, it, it's so cool to hear about your career experience. And, and one of the things I kind of wanted to tap into as you were talking about, you know, your your ability to, to move, you know, drastic locations throughout your, your growth and kind of career journey. Um, what did you have anything specific that you took away maybe from each of those major life experiences of living in a completely different culture? You know, I I will admit I enjoy it. I enjoy um immersing myself in different cultures. And I think it's part of my personal, it's part of who I am, okay? I, I, I grew up in India, moved here as a teenager, you know, did university, and then decided one day, we decided to go see the world and we went to Dubai and Dubai was a little, it was a little town back then, okay? And, and from there, got moved with Microsoft to India to run India, which was a huge, huge opportunity because back then being a country manager meant you were like the CEO of the company. You made like 80% of the decisions, even for a multinational. And then did a bigger regional job in Singapore. And that was, and that was an immersion. People say Asia, but you know, Asia is everything from India to Australia, to Japan, Korea, China, you know, you learn cultures, you learn names, you learn languages, you learn everything. And, and my kids were born along the way. So, you know, they're, um, you know, they're confused. They don't know, you know, we, you know, we're American, but we're of Indian descent, but we grew up in Singapore. And so like, it, it's part of who we are and I thrive on it. And I give executives a nudge, like if you can go, go spend, not in the UK, UK is great, but that's, it's a lot like where, where, where we are right now. Okay. Go to right. Korea, go to India, go to China, you know, go places where, where it makes you a little uncomfortable. Okay. And people go, Oh, yep. my kids, you know, what about the kids? My kids are young. I picked up my kids and took them. I don't know. They've lived in nine places, eight places, you know, they, and you learn languages, you make friends all over the world. They've got friends from all over the, there is, it's part of, it's part of life in my opinion, my personal opinion, just interesting, my opinion, yeah. but when you're making global decisions, it gives you a nuanced view as to how things are received. It gives you a nuanced view as to whether that will, that market entry strategy is relevant or not. Um, it gives you perspective. Priceless, in my opinion, if you're given the chance to do. Um, back then, we had no choice. If you wanted that opportunity, pack your bags and go. You know, thankfully, I had the support of my family, and you know, it worked out just fine. Um, but I don't think enough people do it. Yeah, it, it's fine. I'm, I'm certainly of like the, the same mindset of you when it comes to not only just travel, but extended travel when you can truly become a part of the culture that you're in. And I have found, you know, throughout my years where, where I've had the opportunity to spend extended time out of the country, I just relate so much better to so many different types of people. And I think it just kind of grows an innate curiosity um, that really allows you to keep learning throughout your life. So um, I, I think it's so fantastic that as part of the culture in your organization that you push people for that kind of growth because it, it stays with them forever. I, I think it, I think it worked. Um, you know, I, I encourage my girls. They're both in the workforce. I said before before you have excuses, go, go work somewhere else. Yeah. You know, go, go immerse yourself somewhere. Um, they haven't taken me up on it yet. <laughs> I'm sure they will. They have to think of something really good. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, it was so great getting to know you a little bit more as a person. And, um, you know, we can see your passion for what you do in technology. Um, you have an amazing opportunity where you speak to so many of the executives at the companies that you guys support. Are there any kind of resounding themes or best practices that you think you'd like to leave with our viewers today? Yeah, I think if I take a step, step back, Tracy, I'm a CEO today and I'm in tech, so I have I have understanding of the cyber issues, but if I was in a business that was in shipping or logistics or something else, medical, it isn't what I do every day. 
it isn't what I'm, 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 I'm trained on and, and, you know, thinking about. So it, the, the advice I'd give and the advice I give when I talk to my peer group or, or when they have and I'm asked is just be prepared. Just like your supply chain, you you know what what did COVID teach us? You need multiple routes, you need multiple suppliers, you need options because the, you don't expect the world to shut down, okay? And so don't wait for the attack to happen. Ask questions of your of your of your organization and bring the expertise and to be prepared. You know, ask hard questions because um, you're not an expert in everything, but you got to be good enough today as a CEO to really say, my business needs to be protected. Okay, yeah. because, and so uh, I'm, I'm not one for drama and I'm not one to scare people. I'm just all about, it's like anything else. If you have, you know, if you're dependent on warehousing and trucks and, and logistics and, and, and airplanes, you wanna make sure you have the best capability. Similarly, if you have, if you're a successful company with great IP and, 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 and you're doing well, well, you gotta protect that. You gotta find ways to make sure that, you know, so just be prepared. and. Some of the stuff we talked about allows companies, CEOs to be prepared. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it has been such a joy chatting with you today. I feel like we've really learned a lot about how your organization operates, really the, um, the immense importance that you put on um, your customers' businesses and making sure that they're staying up and they're staying, they're able to be successful um, and resilient. So thank you so much, Sunday. It was a wonderful, wonderful chat. And thank you all for tuning in. Thank you, Tracy.